friend over there that told me to finish a little landscaping there. And uh, I'll pull you along that side. I don't know if you've been to this one. Is this a big white one? Oh, they tell me that. Oh, that's it. It's not much. I'm not going to sit down here. But we're all going to have to have some of the things that we like. And I can tell you the stuff you like, you know, that's what we like. As a valuable environmental treasure and powerful economic engine, the Texas coast and the people who live there are vital to the strength of our state and our nation. With over 3,000 miles of shoreline, the Texas coastal zone is immense with six and a half million residents living in large cities as well as small communities. The Texas coast is a massive economic and business generator for the state and nation. And the Texas coastline is an environmental gem with wildlife, natural habitats, and beaches for families to enjoy. now threatened by disasters which continually place communities at risk, with people's lives, the health of the economy, and our environment in jeopardy. Hurricanes and their associated storm surge of water threaten the viability of the future of the Texas coastline. The Texas coast is subject to coastal erosion, relative sea level rise, coastal storm surge, habitat loss, and water quality degradation. Just looking at two recent storms paint a dangerous and destructive picture. In 2008, Hurricane Ike incurred over $30 billion in damage with 113 deaths. In 2017, Hurricane Harvey incurred over $125 billion in damage with 68 deaths. These storms will continue to challenge Texas and our way of life. As the Commissioner of the Texas General Land Office, I am committed to making sure that this state makes critical decisions that protect the people, economy, and natural resources of the Texas coast. Texas fuels the nation with 30% of the refining capacity and most of the nation's strategic petroleum reserves. The Texas coast is home to the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway, the nation's third busiest inland waterway. More than 564 million tons of cargo pass through Texas ports each year. Ports in Beaumont, Port Arthur, and Corpus Christi all support deployment of our military forces, with Beaumont handling more military cargo than any other port in the United States. Our state's intercoastal waterways support commercial and recreational fishing, as well as recreational activities and tourism. The time is now for Texas and our nation to plan for and then implement solutions to protect our coastal communities, while ensuring our state's and nation's stability for decades to come. The Texas General Land Office is proud to be partnered with the United States Army Corps of Engineers to develop a plan of multiple lines of defense against hurricanes all along the Texas coastline. Here in Galveston at the Army Corps of Engineers Regional Offices, we accept the challenge to take on the dangers that threaten the Texas coast. Our mission is to deliver vital public and military engineering services to strengthen our nation's security, energize the economy, and reduce risks from disasters. In 2015, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, in partnership with the Texas General Land Office, began the $20 million Coastal Texas Protection and Restoration Study. The goal of the study is to provide a long-term approach to enhance resiliency in coastal communities and to improve Texas capabilities to prepare for, resist, recover, and adapt to hurricanes and other coastal hazards up and down the Texas coast. When completed in 2021, the proposed plan will be presented to the United States Congress for authorization and funding. The possible cost, early estimates are in the billions. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is committed to finding engineering solutions for our nation's toughest challenges, and protecting Texas from hurricanes may be the toughest challenge we have faced yet, but we welcome the challenge. What makes this study unique is the sheer magnitude and scale of what we're trying to achieve. This study will identify a number of coastal storm risk management and ecosystem restoration solutions all along the Texas coast. We will create multiple lines of defense using two strategies, 
by constructing large infrastructure and by restoring and utilizing natural ecosystems. The toughest challenge is identifying a solution that would defend the Houston-Galveston region from hurricanes and their destructive storm surges. Every year, hurricanes coming into the Gulf of Mexico threaten to flood the Houston-Galveston region and its surrounding communities and industries. It's no longer a matter of if, but when, the next storm surge threatens the economy and the way of life for millions of Texans. And the threat of sea level rise could make matters worse. In terms of infrastructure, our plan is to construct a coastal storm surge barrier system that's over 70 miles long. The barrier starts on high ground north of High Island. Running the length of the Bolivar Peninsula, crossing the entrance to Galveston Bay, then across the length of Galveston Island, incorporating the existing seawall, continuing to the west, ending at San Luis Pass. At the bay entrance, a system of storm surge gates will be constructed to accommodate deep draft navigation to the ports of Galveston, Texas City, and Houston. A large navigation gate will be placed across the ship channel. Environmental gates will maintain proper flow with the Gulf of Mexico. These movable surge gates across the channel will only close during storms to reduce storm surge into the bay. These gates could be like those found in London on the Thames, in Venice on the Lido Inlet, and along the coastline of the Netherlands. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the Texas General Land Office are working with experts within the United States and around the world to design the most effective barrier system that meets the needs of Texas. Construction of storm surge barrier systems will only be a part of reducing risk to the Texas coast from hurricanes. Maintaining the coast's natural features is critical not only for fisheries, marine mammals, and birds, but also for the people that live and work along the coast. The Coastal Texas study is examining opportunities for ecosystem restoration, including restoring, enhancing, and protecting wetlands, protecting bays and estuaries from erosion, restoring and nourishing beaches and dune systems, creating and enhancing bird rookery islands and oyster reefs, and preserving thousands of acres of seagrasses. These ecosystems are of national importance because they are foraging, nesting, and essential habitats for threatened and endangered species. They also provide nursery habitat for commercially and recreationally important fisheries. The environment along the coastline, islands, shorelines, bays, and estuaries provide the multiple lines of defense we need to protect and restore the state's coast. As an added benefit, these critical natural features will not only provide essential habitats for wildlife, but will reduce the effects of waves and storm surge by absorbing storm energy. The Coastal Texas study will include an environmental impact statement considering impacts to the environment, the economy, and national security interests. Social and cultural resources will also be considered. Throughout the study, we will have public meetings allowing Texans to help understand needs and possible solutions for coastal protection. We want to ensure that all outcomes as it relates to the preservation and maintenance of the affected environment and coastal communities are based on an environmental impact analysis and public input. The Texas General Land Office working alongside the United States Army Corps of Engineers is committed to finding real world solutions to the real world dangers that threaten the coast. The Coastal Texas study will be created to support, protect, and sustain the environment, economy, and culture of our Texas coastline. From Port Arthur to Port Isabel, we will be working with the people that live along the Texas coast to ensure that lives, their property, and their way of life in large cities and small are protected for many generations to come. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am pleased to be here this evening. 
I am Colonel Lars Ederstrom, the commander of the Galveston District of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I welcome tonight's public meeting to review the Coastal Texas Protection and Restoration Feasibility Study. For the record, let me state that this public meeting is, has, was convened at 5.30 p.m. on 18 December 2018 at the Bay Area Community Center in Seabrook, Texas. Specifically, we are presenting information and accepting public comments on the draft integrated feasibility report and environmental impact statement for this study that was released for public review on the 26th of October, 2018. A court reporter is here to transcribe these proceedings in all public comments. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the Texas General Land Office have analyzed coastal risk reduction solutions that would reduce the risk to lives and property on the Texas coast. Ten years ago, the region experienced Hurricane Ike, which disrupted many lives and resulted in extensive economic and infrastructure damages. The Texas coast is also subject to ongoing coastal erosion, relative sea level rise, habitat loss, and water quality degradation. These coastal hazards are placing the environmental and economic health of the coast at risk, which ne negatively impacts the state and national economy. This, along with storms such as Hurricane Ike, Dolly, and Rita, emphasize the need for enhanced resiliency of the coast to not only reduce future damage and loss, but improve our ability to withstand and recover from future storms. It's important to note that the Coastal Texas study recommends structural measures to reduce risk along the coast, and that these recommendations support multiple investments in risk reduction that agencies and businesses are making along the coast today. Coastal Texas is part of a larger effort of risk reduction actions to make the coast more resilient over time. A cost-effective plan has been identified that we believe would significantly reduce the risk of damage from tropical storms and hurricanes, as well as increase the net quality and quantity of coastal ecosystems. This meeting is being held to describe the tentatively selected plan for the TSP and to receive your comments. I hope that all of you had an opportunity to read the notes of availability either on the Galveston District's website or the announcements that were mailed to individuals and organizations that may have an interest in these proceedings. Before we go any further, I'd like to introduce a representative of the Texas General Land Office, our study's non-federal sponsor, Mr. Tony Williams, Planning Senior Director of Coastal Resources. Thank you, Colonel Zeros. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight to learn a little bit more about the Coastal Texas Protection and Restoration Feasibility Study, also known as the Coastal Texas Study. Uh, I want to thank our uh, GLO folks here. Um, we have several representatives from our Upper Coast Field Office and the Austin headquarters. Um, they've been here to provide assistance and thank them for showing up tonight. Uh, addressing issues on the Texas coast, including storm surges and ecosystem enhancement, continues to be one of top priorities for Commissioner Bush. You may be asking, why is the GLO involved in this study? The land office was established to manage state-owned land, including state-owned submerged land under top influence over 10 miles offshore. The land office is also the state agency responsible for implementation of the Coastal Management Program, the Coastal Erosion Planning and Response Act, Beach and Dune Protection, all still response in state waters, and certain roles in disaster recovery. Uh, personally, I've been involved in uh, debris removal in Galveston Bay after Harvey and Ike, and uh, I don't know if y'all remember the uh, cars that were in Seabrook Slough. One of our contractors wanted to use a helicopter to pull those out to minimize impact, so I've been here for a while dealing with these kind of issues. Uh, in November of 2015, the GLO signed the Feasibility Cost Sharing Agreement with the Corps of Engineers for the Coastal Texas Study. This obligated the GLO for funding approximately half of the $20 million study, much of which is being accomplished through working with kind. The land office committed to working with the Corps of Engineers to develop a plan to increase the resiliency of the Texas coast through an integrated approach that includes ecosystem, restoration and enhancement, along with infrastructure. The draft plan that is being presented incorporates habitat restoration and enhancement as well as gates, levees, and flood walls to address erosion, habitat loss, and storm surge. 
These measures work together to increase the overall resiliency of the Texas coast. The plan that is being proposed in the Coastal State Texas study was developed to work in concert with the Texas Coast Resiliency Master Plan. The GLO is currently working with stakeholders along the coast to develop the 2019 version of the Master Plan, which builds on the original plan that was released in 2017. The 2019 version of the Master Plan identifies projects that coastal experts have identified as the ones most effective at increasing coastal resiliency. The 2019 version also includes modeling that identifies threats to the Texas coast and benefits of identified projects. The 2019 version of the Coast Resiliency Master Plan will be completed early next year and presented to the Texas Legislature. The Coastal Texas Study Proposed Plan, or tentatively selected plan, as it is referred to in Corps of Engineers documents, was jointly developed by the GLO and Corps of Engineers. We worked with engineering and environmental firms, consulted with other groups looking into these issues, including local universities and international organizations, had multiple meetings with resource agencies, environmental groups, and navigation interests. As, in, as we move into the next phase of the study, it is important to get feedback from all stakeholders on the proposed plan. Please remember that the study is only a little over halfway through and there's still a lot of details that need to be worked out. Again, we value your input and look forward to your comments. Thank you for joining us here and taking the time to learn more about the study. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Now I would like to recognize public officials who are attending this evening's meeting. First, I'd like to recognize Congressman Randy Weber, U.S. House of Representatives, District 14. <laughs> Beverly Ferguson and other representatives representing Congressman Brian Babin, U.S. House of Representatives, District 36. <laughs> Representative Dennis Paul, Texas House of Representatives, District 129. Paula Nelson, representing Texas House Representative Briscoe Kane, Texas House of Representatives, District 128. Kara Rose, representing Texas House Representative-elect Mays Middleton, Texas House of Representatives, District 23. Mayor Michael Bechtel, Mayor of the City of Morgan's Point. Mayor Pro Tem Amanda Fenwick, Mayor Pro Tem of Clear Lake Shores. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem Natalie Pika, Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Seabrook. <laughs> Neil Moyer, Shore Acres City Council. Larry Milliken, League City City Council. Wanda Zimmer, City of Kima City Council. <laughs> Additionally, I would like to recognize members of the project delivery team of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Team, if you could please raise your not hand to be recognized. <laughs> and now I'd like to describe the ground rules and format for tonight's meeting. I hope that everyone completed an attendance card when you entered the meeting. That attendance card is used to provide us your contact information so we can keep you updated on the status of the study. If you would like to make your comment orally tonight, please make sure that you've indicated your intent on your blue attendance card and you've turned it into the meeting facilitators. If you have not done this already, please do so immediately with the facilitators at the front of the room. Those wishing to make an oral comment will be given an opportunity to do so after the presentation. If you prefer not to speak this evening, you may submit your comments in writing by dropping them in the baskets provided or send them to us by mail or email. Following these open remarks, Dr. Kelly Burks Copes, the project manager, will present an overview of this feasibility study. After her presentation, I will open the floor for public comments. Federal and state officials that are requested to make a statement will be recognized first. Next, representatives from federal and state resource agencies Wishing to make a statement will be called upon.
And then I will recognize each individual from the general public who has indicated that they wish to make a comment. Please keep your remarks to one minute as we would like for everyone to have an opportunity to speak. Also, we would like to emphasize that this will not be a question and answer session. This meeting is to provide everyone with an opportunity to publicly comment on the plan. Please give all speakers the courtesy of not making any comments during their presentation. Please turn off your cell phones and hold all applause or other reactions so that we, we can have an orderly meeting and be respectful of everyone's time. All individuals here have an equal right to be heard. Now I would like to present to you Dr. Kelly Burks Copes, the project manager, to make our presentation. Thank you. Good evening, I'm short. So what I need to do is kind of lay out um, why you're here and what we're intending to do as a part of this process. Um, tonight we are here to provide you with an update on the status of the Coastal Texas Protection and Restoration Study. I'd like to then describe the National Environmental Policy Act and describe how that then interfaces with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers planning process. I'll identify the tentatively selected plan and then walk through the benefits, the impacts, and the costs of the plan. And then we'll open the floor for public comment um, for each of you to have an opportunity to comment on the plan. As the two previous speakers mentioned, we're only halfway through the study. We're at about the end of the third year. We have two and a half years to go. We began in 2015. And we're targeting a report to Congress in the early spring of 2021. The draft report was released in October of 26, and this is the seventh, uh, this is the final of seven public meetings that we've held up and down the coast for the last month and a half. The study's massive. It's uh, enormous. It's complex. Usually, when you do an environmental impact statement, you allow for a 45-day public review comment because the study was so large. We decided to extend that to 75 days, which means that it began on the day that the report was released in October, October 26th of this year, and it will close then on January 9th of 2019. Inviting public comment is mandated by the NEPA, and all comments are welcome, positive or negative. Remember, the more specific you are with your comments, the easier it will be for us to understand what your concerns and issues are and to address those issues. Public and agency input then informs our decisions, and all comments that are provided will be evaluated equally. The review and the comment then ensures that our decisions are based on the best available information. <coughs> You're very well aware of the threats to this region. We know that there is a threat to the economy um, based on, uh, as a result of coastal storm surge. We know we have inland erosion as well as coastal erosion. We're losing threatened nature habitat up and down the coast, and we're losing our deltas, the natural processes that form them. We also experience a great deal of disrupted hydrology. In the Corps of Engineers, the way that you uh, work through the planning process is that you identify goals and objectives. In terms of goals, Congress mandated that we not only look at coastal storm management, but also ecosystem restoration. And by doing both of those simultaneously, we can come up with multiple lines of defense to promote resilience up and down the coast. To meet the goals, we set up a series of measurable objectives. In this instance, our objectives are highlighted here. To reduce economic damage, to reduce risk to critical infrastructure, but also to public health and safety and to increase resilience by enhancing and destroying, destroying coastal landforms as well as improving hydrologic connectivity up and down the coast, and then keying in or honing in on critical habitats such as coastal marshes and bays. We received funding at a national level from Congress, which means that we have to justify the significant resources in our region to receive that funding. In this instance, as you're well aware, the study area uh, covers 18 counties. Within the area, there are 6.1 million people, which is about 25% of the Texas population. We also have a series of deep draft ports, which we've listed here, and 450 miles of Gulf Intercoastal Waterway. 40% of the nation's <coughs> petrochemical industry resides in the footprint, and 25% of the national petroleum refining capacity 
happens within our study area. But in addition to that, we have NASA, and down on Galveston Island, we have UTMB, which has a level four bio lab. Because we were duly funded for both coastal storm risk management and ecosystem restoration, we have to highlight and point out the national, national significant resources that are natural. In this instance, we have one of only six in the world rare hypersaline lagoons, the Laguna Madre. The Padre Island National Seashore is in our study area, as well as 12 national wildlife refuges. We have two of the 28 national estuary program sites, and the Central Flyway Migration Corridor runs straight through the study area. All told, we have critical habitat up and down the, the, um, the study area for threatened and endangered species. And in terms of ecosystems, we're talking about wetlands, seagrasses, oyster reefs, and sea turtle nesting habitat. Now, the way the core works is that we formulate plans in sort of like a building block process. We combine features and actions and treatments to formulate measures, and then comment, combine measures to generate plans or alternatives is another word. In this instance, features are levees and marshes engaged. The actions are things like restoration and construction, and the treatments are things we might do now, but also in the future, such as plantings or renourishments. When we combine those together, we get measures, and then we get plans. In 2016, we were mandated by four, the uh, Congress not to reinvent the wheel. Several uh, agencies and entities in the region have been accumulating data. For example, NOAA has a sea level rise viewer that you can go out and look at different scenarios to determine what might be inundated under a variety of sea level rise scenarios. FEMA has the inundation mapping already. We also have several other types of studies going ongoing in the region. The GCCPRD has a plan. Texas A&M has the Ike Dyke, for example. The GCCPRD has the coastal spine. Speed Center has something called they call the HGAP plan. Um, this is not those, but this starts with those. Um, we were directed by Congress to bounce off of those, take what we could from those plans, combine them, and formulate a plan much bigger in terms of not only, only coastal storm risk management, but to combine ecosystem restoration with the plan. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has several ongoing studies in the area, um, particularly after post Harvey with the Recovery Act. And so we were uh, looking at something of a systems of systems approach where we could fill gaps where those plans were not focused. GLO also has a master plan, as Tony mentioned, where they have identified numerous sites up and down the coast for ecosystem restoration. And so our plan fills gaps that that plan does not cover. Uh, the Restore Act, is, as well as Audubon, has sites out here. And those sites are um, connected. And we were looking for synergies when we proposed the sites that we have proposed in the plan. We began in 2014 with a series of scoping meetings in the region. And we took all of that information together with the goals and objectives and formulated our plans. The measures were kind of uh, caveated by region. Each region had a series of concerns and issues that needed to be addressed. And so we formulated measures to address those concerns. We used screening criteria, including the goals and objectives, to bring those down to a manageable number. And then we made plans uh, from those measures. We assess plans and their success or their um, functionality on the basis of the three E's in the Corps of Engineers. Engineeringly sound, which I'm not sure that's a word. <laughs> Environmentally acceptable and economically justified. We have used a series of uh, tools to assess each of these criteria. So for example, we have developed a series of novel coastal storms using ADSERC, which is an advanced circulation model, to basically spin up storms that we've never seen before. 600 storms were actually created with the tools and then we ran them against the coast and assessed what the water levels were with each of those storms. And then we put barriers in place and looked at the reductions in risks and then assessed benefits of putting various uh, barriers in place. In addition to the storm models, we also ran something called ADH, which is an advanced hydrologic model that looked at constrictions that would, might be caused by the barriers put in uh, the channel and what that would do to the back bay. So in other words, would it affect salinity? Would it affect sedimentation? Would it affect velocities and currents? And so we use these tools to compare and contrast a variety of plans 
and then to ultimately select a potentially selected plan that met these criteria. So I'm going to talk about two of the final plans that we actually looked at. The first one we call the Coastal Barrier, or Alternative A. It starts at High Island, it moves across the GIWW with a gate, and then it runs down the Bolivar Peninsula to the inlet. We have navigable gates that uh, connect to the seawall on Galveston side. We tie into the Ream Levee, and then we run down the rest of Galveston Island to San Luis Pass, keeping San Luis Pass open. Around Galveston, there is a ring levee proposed with uh, pumping stations, that's what the triangles are on the map, and a closure at Offutt's. Up on the west side of the Galveston Bay, uh, we do anticipate, even though the surge barrier would reduce the storm surge or capture that storm surge at the front, once the storm moves over the peninsula and, and lands in the back bay, it would still have wind-driven surge that would push up into this area. And so we are proposing two gated systems, one at Dickinson and one at Clear Creek. And as um, we expect, when those gates are closed, water could potentially back up behind them. So we have proposed pumping stations at those locations to draw the water off until we raise the gates back up as the storm passes. The wind-driven surge could potentially affect um, some of the locally, some of the communities here. So we have proposed what the Corps calls non-structural measures in this area. That's raisings and floodproofing, looking at evacuation routes, and potentially buyouts, but not necessarily, and ultimately that would be a last. Um, <coughs> Keep this uh, plan in mind when I move to the next plan. This one's along the coast, whereas the second plan is along the rim. The idea would be that we would start at San Jacinto and cross with a gated structure and a pumping station, and then run a barrier along the rim, going across again at Clear Lake, and at Dickinson Bayou with much larger structures this time because the water would be held back from the entire barrier and we would need larger pumping stations. We would tie into the Texas City levee and enhance the levee system and then extend it off to the west. In this plan, we would still have a ring barrier around Galveston that would need to be close on the back and uh, water that comes in uh, during the storm would need to be pumped out. We'd still need a gate at Offutt's Bayou. The thing to be aware of is that the Galveston ring levee would need to, the ring levee would need to be higher because it would have to withstand the full front of the forces that were coming at it. In a Corps of Engineers, when we generate these plans, then we have to compare and contrast the pros and cons of each of the plans. So for an example, Plan A does provide risk reduction to the nav channel, to the navigation channel, and to the Gulf Coastal Inner Waterway. Um, the Plan B does not. It is up along the rim, and so it exposed, it leaves them exposed. Uh, plan A provides benefits for uh, all of the different streams of benefits, whereas Plan B does not. And so what we do is we compare and contrast the plans in this fashion, and we determine what the benefit cost ratio is, and then we select a tentatively selected plan. Now, all of this is focused on Region 1, which is up in this region, the Houston Galveston area. Down in the South Padre Island area, they have been using beneficial use dredge material to um, build up dunes and beaches along that beach shore uh, front, but it's intermittent. It's dependent on funding, and so it doesn't happen regularly. So what we're proposing is a two-mile long stretch of 12 and a half by 100 foot dunes that would be renourished every 10 years. It's currently economically defensible in reaches four and three, where we are um, receiving new economic input, and in the next phase of the study, we will continue to assess the other reaches in that region. But remember that our mandate was not only coastal storm risk management, but ecosystem restoration. So in this instance, we have proposed nine separate locations where we would uh, restore marshes, beaches and dunes, islands and seagrass, for example, to the tune of approximately 160,000 acres of restoration up and down the coast. They not only provide habitat for critical species, but they also provide first and second lines of defense. If we um, put beaches and dunes out in front of a coastal barrier and marshes in the back, then we're providing one after another after another line of defense for coastal storm surge. So the tentatively selected plan is a combination of plan A, which is the coastal barrier, in addition to the nine ecosystem restoration sites and the coastal risk management structures in South Padre. The cost is $23 billion to $32 billion. 
But remember that 40% of that cost is ecosystem restoration. The barrier system would run approximately 400, uh, I'm sorry, 14 to 19 billion. And the ecosystem restoration would run approximately 8.9 to 11.9 billion. Um, the thing to remember is that the costs of the barriers in this plan mimic or are very similar to the GCC PRD's proposal. We do anticipate impacts with the plan. We will be directly imp impacting approximately 4,500 acres onshore of different types of habitats um, as we move down the coast. But we also know that the barrier that we have proposed that crosses the navigation channel will cause a constriction. Um, the system is open most of the time. It is a proposed floating sector gate, which is like a fan. When the, when the storm comes, it closes, but the rest of the year it's open. It has to reside on artificial islands, and those islands take up cross-section inside the nav channel or across that inlet, for example. We have those two planned in addition to a recreational um, gate, which will allow small, smaller ships to move through, smaller boats. And then to the right of that and the left of that will be another 38 vertical lift gates, all closing off the pass when necessary when the storms are coming, but staying open the rest of the year. Each time you have something in the water, it's causing a, a reduction in the cross-section, so it causes a constriction. So at this point, of, um, at this time in our plan, we are estimating a 27% constriction. In the next phase of the study, we're hoping to bring that down. Right now, we expect that mitigating that will cost between $676 and $906 million. But that is in addition to the 160,000 acres of ecosystem restoration that we are proposing. <coughs> what I need to point out, what I really need to emphasize tonight, is that this system is still a placeholder. It is conceptual. In the next phase of the study, once we receive input from yourself and others from the other um, uh, public meetings, as well as uh, feedback that we've received through our mailbox and through the mail, we will be refining the plan. Uh, refining includes realignments, where we would move um, the line in different directions. It could come, uh, for example, on Bolivar towards the ocean. We are looking at types of features that can be used. It does not all have to be gray infrastructure. It can be combinations of dunes and T-walls. It can also include ecosystem restoration in front and back. And so we're talking about a system of multiple lines of defense. As part of the optimization, we have to look at <clears throat> types of gates. Um, we would like to minimize the, uh, the impacts that we're seeing and bring that constriction number way down, below 27%. It, any design that we are proposing from here on out will never exceed the 27% constriction for benefit cost reasons. Um, but we also need to look at um, pumping stations and the capacity of the pumping stations and the gates at Dickinson, Clear Creek, Offutt, and the GIWW. So it's early. It's early in the process, and that's why we're here. Uh, we've proposed something, and we're asking for your feedback. We have about two and a half years left for the study. Then we uh, generate a report that we present to Congress. Uh, Congress needs to then authorize us to continue to the design phase and appropriate funds for us to do so. Once they have done that, we begin the design process. If we receive all the funding all at once, we can start the design and it would take two to five years. But if it's piecemealed out, then it will take longer. We will also need to have a cost share sponsor identified at that point to go into design. Right now, um, the study is 50-50 cost shared with the Texas GLO. We do not have a cost share sponsor identified yet for design. The Texas legislature is meeting in January. They may be able to take it up this year. If they can't, then we have to wait till 2021 for the next cycle. Um, we do realize that, or you need to realize, that the Corps of Engineers is funded through Water Resource Development Acts. And those happen approximately every two years. So once we present our co to Congress the report, the next Water Development Act is in 2022, if they continue uh, funding as they have in the last two or three cycles. Building and construction uh, would begin then after the two to five years of design if all goes well, and it could take up to 15 years to build. Once it's constructed, we turn it over to the cost share sponsor for operations and maintenance. 100% of the cost is shouldered by the cost share sponsor. 
We are anticipating or we have estimated that operation and maintenance would cost between $100 and $130 million each year annually. Same thing. So here's the point. It's early in the process. We are trying to gather comment from the public. We have held six meetings thus far. This is our seventh um, and, and concluding meeting so far. Um, if you would like to come up to the mic tonight and provide comments, that would be great. If you don't want to do that, um, you have comment cards that were handed out today. You can fill those in and place those in the baskets in the back of the room. I think one of the things we need to mention is that you can do both. Um, you can come up and comment, and then you can go back and turn in a card as well. You can send a letter. Um, we have the address here, or you can hit our mailbox and send an email. But the key here is that we need the comments by January 9th to be able to incorporate them into the administrative record and our process. Now, I talk very fast. I have a funky accent. I completely get that. There is a website out there, um, coastalstudy.texas.gov. It houses the reports and all of the appendix, appendices. The video that you just saw, as well as the video in the corner, will be out there starting tomorrow. All of the posters have been loaded up, and my presentation will be loaded up so that you can review it at your leisure. Um, but that's, that's basically it. We have the information up there, and we're interested and um, very, very um, interested in what you have to say, what your feedback would be, and any kind of uh, specific comments that you can provide, provide us informs our decision-making process. So I want to thank you for coming tonight, and I want to encourage you to get up and talk to us, but if you're a um, little shy, fill in the comment cards. It works the same, okay? Thank you very much.
We want to make sure that everybody gets their voice heard. I apologize over time, but it's very, very important to thank you all for being here. Thank you all for the indulgence. Thanks, sir. Next, I would like to invite Beverly Ferguson, representing U.S. Congressman Brian Babin, U.S. House of Representatives, <laughs> District 36. Good evening. Uh, we are here representing Congressman Brian Babin to hear your inputs put. So if you have anything, your, your comments, we want to hear your comments. And we also have put in a letter of support for a 45-day extension so that you can uh, put more comments and so and give you time to do that. And so thank you. Thank you for your comments. All right. Next, I'd like to invite Paula Nelson, representing Texas House Representative Briscoe Kane, Texas House of Representatives District 128. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next, I'd like to invite Commissioner Ken Clark, Commissioner for Galveston County, Precinct 4. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, Ken Clark, County Commissioner, Galveston County, Precinct 4. I just want to encourage you to do the 45-day uh, increase in the time uh, because even though you started this process in October, we're just now really kind of getting a sense of what you all are presenting. We need input from our citizens to be able to make good decisions. In the, in the season of Christmas and the holidays, uh, public agendas are limited. Uh, some councils only meet once a month, once in December, and we have a 72-hour posting requirement. Plus, it takes us time to get our, our thoughts together and come up with, uh, with our comments moving forward, and we could use the extra time, because if we do that, we'll make better decisions on this first round of public comment. So hopefully, in the end, we'll shorten the, the gap up and and have a better better product moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I would next like to invite Representative Dennis Paul, Texas House of Representatives, for his comments. Thanks a lot, uh, Congressman. I've been here 58 years. I ain't got 65. <clears throat> but I'd like to say support for the project. I think we're really interested in getting this going forward and making it happen. Hopefully Congress can fund it off of this report when it comes out. I uh, also would like to say, uh, I really want to make sure we emphasize uh, the postal spy at option A, as well as maybe looking at the gate at St. Louis Pass, if that's necessary, that, that might be something that we could use. And uh, we are going to be working hard on this in this session to make sure that we get the necessary state requirements to do to get this done, to be a partner with you all. Thank you for what you're doing, and uh, we look forward to hearing the final part of this study and working what we can do to get it done. Thank you, sir. I would like to invite Mayor Pro Tem Amanda Fenwick, Mayor Pro Tem of Clear Lake Shores. Thank you. I would like to invite Councilman Neil Moyer, Shore Acres City Council. Good evening. Uh, I'm a resident of Shore Acres, member of the City Council there. Um, Shore Acres has about 650 residents. More than half of them were affected and damaged by storm surge so hurricane Ike, and more than 10 percent of them were affected by storm surge so as a result of parking. Um, needless to say, managing, mitigating, minimizing storm surge on Galveston Bay, Clear Lake, Taylor Lake, and up through Taylor Bayou are absolutely necessary. Those are the sources, as well as Galveston Bay, of the storm surge and flooding which occurred in Ike and subsequently with Harvey. Needless to say, we're strongly interested in seeing the plan and ultimately implementation. God willing, God might be around by the completion of that, completion of that um, to see that approach taken. We also strongly recommend the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Texas uh, Parks and Wildlife um, Agency be uh, specifically drawn into your environmental studies under NEPA. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. I'd like to invite Councilman Larry Milliken, League City City Council. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much for having the open house and the informative session tonight. I'm concerned about uh, two things. One being the conveyance of water from Clear Creek and Dickinson Mile 
with the additional storm surge protection there at those two outlets, uh, worrying about the need for the increased conveyance currently right now on both those watersheds, um, and if putting some sort of storm surge protection would uh, affect that in any way um, because of the need to increase that. The other thing is that I would say that um, I'm concerned about which to do first, and I think that the storm surge barrier along the perimeter of the, the Gulf Coast would be uh, better served to, to build that first and uh, worry about inland reconstruction. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'll now call member. Uh, call, excuse me. I'll now call on members of the general public who wish to make a statement. I'll call three names at a time. Please be seated in the front row to wait your turn to speak. I've asked Mr. Stokes to assist me in keeping time. He will indicate when you have 30 seconds left to speak and when your time has expired. I ask that you stop speaking after your one minute has elapsed. When called upon, please come forward, speak into the microphone. Please identify yourself by your full name and the organization you represent, if any. I will now call upon the first members of the general public to come forward. Mike Chambers, Sandra Chambers, and Phyllis Clary. If you could please come forward for your comments. Mike Chambers. I represent the residents, I guess, along the coastline. Um, um, my wife and I recently purchased a lot in Spanish Grant. We, uh, we have plans in retirement there. And uh, we just closed on it and found out, we just now found out about this plan. So we have some concerns, and, and the whole neighborhood that, that I'm with out there is concerned with the, the barriers that we have recently heard about. One is the barrier along along 3005, and we're concerned with the backwash there. We're concerned if that barrier was placed in, on the Gulf side um, shore, that also would affect our views. So we are in favor of the, the more natural ecological views of, of, of structured dunes. So that is what we say. Thank, Thank you for your comments. Where are the two of the other individuals present for their comments? I'll we'll move to the next three individuals. Joe Camarada, Jay Williams, and Joan Addison. If you could please come forward. Yes, sir. Howdy, I'm Joe Camarada. I um, was affected by Ike and also affected by Harvey. I lost property uh, over in Bolivar. And uh, then, of course, Harvey put uh, 18 inches of water in my house. So uh, I'm glad that we're doing something. I appreciate it, you know, the effort. And uh, I am more, more of a natural one, so the walls and stuff like that. But I just appreciate that we are going to get something going. Thank you. Thank you, sir. move on to the next three individuals. I'd like to invite Marvin Davis, Marcus Rivas, Director of Galveston County Consolidated Drainage District, and Lori Westerman, if you're available to come forward for your comments. My name is Marvin Davis. Uh, I have a home down on the west end of Galveston. It's not my primary home, it's a second Place. But uh, I think y'all are doing a lot of good work here. I know that the uh, pumping stations and the levee in Texas City have provided lots of protection for Texas City. They've been great. Uh, myself and my family lived in Texas City during Hurricane Carla before the levee was built. And uh, wow, what a mess we had. Um, 
as I looked at everything around, all the posters and everything, I um, have had trouble understanding why there's not a barrier being built at said Louis Pass. Uh, they tried to explain it. I haven't been able to quite uh, justify it in my mind because that worries us is that we're going to get a surge from the backside of the new levee when you put it in. So just take that into consideration. I'm sure you are already. Thank you for your comments, sir. Ma'am, if you'd like to come forward. I'm Lori Westerman. Um, we're a business owner here in Seabrook, and we were affected greatly during Ike, um, not so much during Harvey. We appreciate all the information that you've given us, and the approach that you're taking looks to be something that we're very um, excited about. It's actually happening much better than going up 146, which would have left off way too many of us. Um, my concern is, though, that we've been to so many of these meetings, we've always put our name down to please contact us and things that are going on, and the information going out that these public meetings are being held is not going out well. And so for future public meetings, please, please try to inform our city. The Seabrook people are doing really well at disseminating in, any information they find, but they're not getting some of the information either. So we can get a better dissemination of information. You'll have this room flooded and people standing outside. Thank you for your comments, ma'am. I'd like to invite the next three members to come forward for their comments. Hubert Brasso, George Anna Collins, and Shady Henry. Thank you, Colonel. My name is Shady Henry. I am a resident of uh, Seabrook, Texas. Um, I am encouraged by what you're doing and by the time and expense you're taking to communicate with us. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, I would like to echo some of the comments by uh, the League City uh, official. It's uh, to, uh, to stress the focus on the coastal barriers as, uh, as seen by uh, the models. They seem to be much more effective. Also, I would like to ask you, consider the rainfall, the rate of rainfall during the storm as a very important part when a storm surge situation is coming to our area. Rainfall comes and it greatly affects our city and the drainage from that will collect somewhere. So uh, I want to encourage you to consider that in some, in some of the models. I've seen on the NOAA website that there are some, uh, some estimates on that, on that and history of data of previous storms. We can probably use that to consider that and the rate of drainage that we don't create another barrier that just collects water behind the, the levees. Thank you. Thank you. I guess in, in looking at your proposal, um, one of the things I am concerned about is the uh, the, uh, the dams or the, the, the floodgates and the Clear Creek Channel and, and uh, Dickens Bayou and uh, the engineering of those. Uh, you know, I, I thought they were going to be natural, but you know, I guess in part of the uh, presentation I've heard of, of uh, pumps needed as well. You know. Uh, Time of a uh, you know, those those could easily become dams in a Harvey situation, um, and we also have problems with electricity uh, at times of the storm. So trying to get that uh, uh, that uh, there, I, I do appreciate y'all uh, actually looking at the program and looking at doing something that is one of my concerns. Uh, I do agree with the uh, uh, the, the, the Bolivar. Uh, Thing. And, and I was thinking with the uh, with the uh, gates across the channel, um, are you all thinking of putting a road on that as well uh, to bridge across Galveston Bay uh, versus continuing to remind on the ferry? I know uh, during a time of a hurricane, 
I saw some very difficult getting in and out of Bolivar uh, because of the, the ferry stops running after after some. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Sir. Thank you. I'm Georgiana Collins. My family moved here to Texas in 1904, and my mom was born on Galveston Island. And I work with ERNAC, and we're developing an international guidance document for natural and nature-based features. So I wanted to encourage the Corps to look at opportunities to uh, undertake engineering with nature, which is an intentional alignment of engineering and environmental sciences. And uh, we've developed a, uh, a plan where we can link restoration and protection, not have them separate. And, uh, the plan actually shows or highlights a $50 million benefit to the oyster industry, huge water quality benefits, uh, additional uh, habitat, um, 30,000 jobs being created, as well as millions of dollars of damages being avoided when we also use natural nature-based features in Galveston Bay. So. Thank you for your comments. I'd like to invite the next three individuals for their comments. Paul Grout, Deb Hale, and John E. Wilson. And just as a reminder, if you're queued for your comments, there are chairs reserved for you. Thank you, sir. Two individuals I called still available for their comments. I'd like to invite the next three individuals Holly Larson, Melissa Terrell, and Craig and Sherry Bicycle. Peterson, Diane Humes, and Charles Taylor. Thank you. I'm Diane Humes. I'm a volunteer uh, who has spent about 20 years living here doing prairie and wetland restoration and also water quality testing. And I would just like to encourage you to do as much ecological restoration in your project as possible because I think it will have maximum and multiple benefits for everybody and every facet. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I'd like to draw your attention to the structures going across the mouth of um, the uh, inlet to uh, Galveston Bay. Uh, you saw it in the video, and you can see it back there, and if you haven't, if you missed that, you can catch it on uh, Houston Chronicle uh, on the web, uh, an article on November 12th. So those structures, I'd like for you to stay focused on those structures, it shows the the large swing gate, and some other smaller structures in line with that. Now those are lift gates, and in between each one is a concrete structure. It's 38 gates, 39 uh, structures, 102 feet each. So that adds up to 4,000 feet across this 9,000 foot opening. That's quite a restriction. We don't want restriction of water out of the bay. We need that. So now they told me that it's a 27% increase uh, in restriction. My calculations were uh, a lot more. They're probably right, but we don't want any. I think they're trying, and I believe it's, uh, I, they're really trying to do that. but. Hurricane Ike was $30 billion of damage. That's a hurricane. Hurricane Harvey was $125 billion of damage. That was a rain event for Houston. For Houston, 
party, a rain event, of which we have many. So my message to you is don't let them put up any restriction across the mouth of Galveston Bay. We need to let that water flow out. That's Thank the important you. part. Thank you for your comments. I'd like to invite the next three individuals. Thomas E. Diegelman, Dale Coltard, and Joe Bryan. My name is Tom Diegelman. I'm a resident of Seabrook. I've been here for 40 years. I've seen a few things come and go called storms. And uh, despite the fact that there are some people that ecologically may think this is a challenge, I think that can be addressed because I've seen that done. I was part of the wetlands board in the city of Seabrook. I know what you can do when you put your mind to it. So, you know, I think that we know how to build walls, although the big challenge would appear to me to be not how to construct this and be ecologically sound, but to get the funding for the walls, because as I see going on now, walls are just not a popular thing. But <laughs> that aside, the will to do it and to put a singular plan out there that is not going to die a death of a thousand cuts, which is what's happened to our space program, happened to many other things in this country. You have to say, this is what we need to do, we need to go do it, here's the reason why. The other alternatives don't measure up. Sir, this is so many dollars and move on. That's what we need to see in this, and I hope we can get there in this study. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My name is Dale Cotard. I live in Houston. Uh, it seems like a big part of this study is focusing on the refinery capacity in the Baytown area and protecting that. To do that, I would just put a levy around Baytown refineries and leave it at that. It worked well in Texas City and leave the, the coastline, the 70 miles of protection alone and let natural ha habitat exist. Thank you for coming. I'd like to invite the next three individuals, John Powell, Christina Vasquez, and Mark Kramer. Hello, thank you for being here tonight. I am Christina Vasquez, I'm a League City resident, but we have a secondary property on the Bolivar Peninsula. Um, our little home actually survived Ike with only garage damage. Um, and I do ask that you guys give full consideration to the residents, not only of Bolivar, but to Galveston Island as well. We have lots of concerns over the backflow. And not only that, but the insurability and the property values of our homes there. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mark Kramer, resident in Galveston Bay area. Uh, I have a special interest in Galveston Bay as someone who loves to paddle and fish in the area. And I know from an estuarine perspective how critical salinity levels are in waterways like Galveston Bay. Estuaries are a place where rivers meet to sea, where seawater and freshwater mix. And by my understanding of the complexity of how rainfall rates are changing in Houston as we experienced in Hurricane Harvey, how impermeable surfaces are increasing in the Galveston Bay watershed, and how increasingly development since Hurricane Carla, which was my first hurricane to go through here, have happened, that there is a significant change in freshwater inflows. And to be concerned for me about how that tidal influx is going to be uh, altered over time. I'm curious why we don't have a comparative analysis if we're going to spend $34 billion, why it all has to be structural. Uh, if there is any reason why we can't spend money on other alternatives. I uh, have a family that comes from New Orleans and I've had an opportunity to look at structural solutions and pump solutions. 
And we here in Harris County have recently had a ballot measure that enabled citizens to give some input in their flooding opinions. I'd encourage you to consider the same thing. Thank you for your